Hey, y'all good? What'd it do? <laughs> I want to talk to y'all about a pressing matter. How long has it been pressing with me? Ah, uh, most of my adult life. Y'all know what's something? When I woke up this morning, I said, I, now I know I got to go live tonight. I had nothing to talk about tonight. Well, those of you who are teachers and preachers and orators, y'all already know the struggle. I had nothing to talk about tonight to the point where I'm just going to call it off, take a night off. But I had some things. I always got stuff in the, in the back burner. There's always something to talk about. Don't get me wrong. There's always something to talk about. It's, it's never a boring moment in my life. All right? Never a boring moment in my life. And If you are a believer and a Christian, you should never be bored. There's always something to do, all right? But then you got to take some rest. I won't go talk about nothing. And then I had the audacity to pick up the phone when my brother Jeff uh, Jackson called on my way home. He and his wife and his wonderful, their wonderful daughter, Courtney, talked to me on the phone. Oh, I talked to them. I don't know who did all the talking. <laughs> and they began to talk about how the church manipulated them. Now, we were on the subject of tithing, all right? And y'all know that's a hotbed topic. It blows up. The fact that I just said tithing, it rang through all the American homes, and now a 1,000 people are going to be tuning into the show and start going into the comment section. Let me tell you about tithing. <laughs> There's going to be two sides. One is the Lord said to do it, and the other one will be like, hey, 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 you're going to be bankrupt in a minute, <laughs> all right? But... You could talk about tithing every day for the whole year and never run out. <laughs> never run out. I'm calling this manipulation and, uh, and illiteracy. Church hurt is your fault. <laughs> I know. I know. I have to give both sides of it. I can't keep letting us, like myself, other content creators, and many of you, keep crying over somebody who manipulated you and used witchcraft on you in church. I can't keep allowing us to keep beating up these wolves in sheep clothing, which we should continue to beat them up, and not take you all across my knee and spank you who is sitting in church and allowing this manipulation to continue and then going crying to God and saying, how did this happen to me? There's a reason why, and this is why I'm going to talk to you tonight about it. Let Uncle Sir get into your living room, dining room, wherever you're. I don't want to be in your bedroom. Don't tell me I'm there. I don't. I don't. If if I if you're watching me in your bedroom on TV, that's fine. But don't tell me. Don't tell me. Don't tell me. Don't, don't give me a vision. I was talking to a brother who was a graduate of um, Howard University, which is the Black Yale. <laughs> okay. Or is it Black Harvard? I think it's Black Harvard. I'm talking to him while after church, and he said, I got it now. I said, I, what? He says, I get it now. He says, I've been listening to you talk. This was back, this was 20 years ago. He said, I've been listening to you talk. Day in and day out. You come here, you do, and you say it, and I notice how you interact with people after church. I notice how you interact and talk to people, and, and people just seem to grab a hold. They didn't like you. He said, I just couldn't figure it out until right now. He said, have you been reading the book called How to Win Friends and Influence People? I said, how did you know that? What gave that away? <laughs> what gave that away? I said, not only have I read the book over and over again, I am the book. I could have wrote the book by Brother Dale Carnegie. I know it was written back in the early 1900s. It, it, this thing goes all the way back, y'all. The copyright on this book is 1936. I wrote this book. Here's the thing about this book, all right? I wasn't going to, again, I wasn't going to go, I didn't know what to talk about until I talked to, to the Jackson family. 
unrelated to Mike and, and Tito and the rest of them. Uh, all right, but I'm looking in this book, and I didn't know I had forgotten that my wife at the time was in school. I was the only one supporting her through school, not just financially, but morally and spiritually. She would Every day, she would come home from work, from waiting tables, grab her books, go to school. She was in community college. She would come home, bring her books home, put it on the table and go to bed. She was exhausted. And I would take her books and open them up at night and read them and pour in my brain all of this education because I could not afford to go to college, right? Plus, I was a new father, a new husband. I needed to find ways, other ways to make money. I had time to go to college if I could afford it. So I would soak up all of her her. Uh, psychology books, physiology, earth science, all this stuff. And then this book was sitting, book was sitting on the table. And to, to prove to you that this is hers, my, my children's mama's name is Cosetta Jones. That's her handwriting right there. And you can see this book is old because look at that. And that's rust <laughs> and mildew from, <laughs> I, f- I just found the book. The Lord said, go grab that book. There it is. And I remember right here, this page here says, do this and you'll be welcome anywhere. You'll be welcome (laughs) anywhere. This is my handwriting. Suck up to people. Show plenty interest. (laughs) What was I thinking when I wrote this 30 years ago? 35 years ago, what was I thinking? It must have been working for me. Never knew that the day would come when I I would be teaching the way I do and have the show that I do and what blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So people can tell. They see something in you. So I wanted to do this show. Thanks, Jackson. The Jackson family blame them for this show. So if I I get any cards and letters to my P.O. box, I'm forwarding them to a little town in Florida somewhere over there in the Tampa Bay area. (laughs) Okay. So let me talk to you people who are easily manipulated. My father, I, I got hit by one of my brothers. (laughs) and i went to my father larry hit me my father i'm thinking was gonna go spank larry's behind but he didn't my father turned to me and asked me can somebody put it in the comment section now you have to be uh in your 50s and 60s and 70s to know what the comment or the response is going to be if you're young folks you don't know what you don't know nothing about this but my father asked me a question can somebody put it in the comment section Hmm? Hmm? i like to know i'm testing y'all i I gotta start my show come on let's get this ball moving let's go what do y'all think my father said Hmm? Hmm? i know this is coming in it's coming in slow because it's coming in slow Here's what he said. Thank you, Donna, because the, the comments do come in slow. I know y'all typed it already, but it takes a while for, for me to see it. Donna got it. Devin got it. Danny got it. Michelle got it. Rogers, all y'all got it. Let me show y'all. These bunkers on top of it. Everybody got it. What did you do? Y'all already know where I'm going, right? What is it that you did? Why would your brother just up and hit you for no reason? You did something, and sometimes my father would beat me because I provoked my brother to anger. Jesus, same way. God the Father, the Ancient of Days, is the same way. You provoked your brother to anger, and God punishes you because you provoked that anger. To the point where the Scripture says, Fathers, do not provoke your sons or children to anger. (laughs) But bring them up in the admonition of the Lord. It's your fault. 
Good to see you, Chatham Gale. Bless it to you and all you bunkers. All right. So what do we do with this? I'm going to talk about you are the ones who allow the wolves to have their way with you. Some of you ladies are damsels in distress. You are an easy target. Soon as you walk in the room, he or she know you're easy. Easy like Sunday morning. I see you in 60. Report live, seven days a week, always on time, but this time is not free. So watch the Jones, always on sleek. Latest trending topics, how you jumping out your seat? Controversial subject, others can't touch it. Community full of people going rocks from the bunk. Up to politics, finance, music, and religion. Stirring up the poverty, bring healing to the village. Son named Walter, daughter named Rebecca. Grew up on the south side, who know do it better. So watch the Jones from the Tribeca. He got something to say, put your hands together. Hello, everybody. It's Swalter, Swalter, Swalter Jones Show. I'm he. It is the midday. Nope. Evening. Adi- nope. Weekend edition. Baby. <laughs> Come on in. <laughs> the water is fine. How y'all doing, y'all? Whole bunch of bunkers here. Y'all see these wonderful bunkers here. Michelle Jackson. Uh, 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 let's see. Who does she live? Brett and uh, the other oh, Lula B is here. I haven't seen Lula B in a while. In a while. Brett and Marlene and uh, Proctor and oh, April and Drea and Nancy and uh, but Michael, Michelle, uh, Dr. K is here. Uh, all, all y'all, Edward is here. So good to see you all here. I want to get into this lesson so that y'all can see something very important. The problem may not be it is the person over the pulpit. It's a problem. But you, <laughs> you have coddled. You have coddled. You have enabled these monsters in your churches. You did this. So I'm going to upset you, so please sit down and buckle up. Jackson's blamed them for this. I want to show y'all something here. Do I have it? All right, because this is a part of the American system. Have you ever had a conversation that schools don't teach you how to think. Have you ever been frustrated that you spent so many years in school and yet you come out with only the ability to regurgitate information? Is that you? Surely it was me. What if I told you that independent thought wasn't the purpose of education in the first place? You all were robots. The decades before and after the 1900s was the period of the Industrial Revolution. And this is where many of the legendary billionaires made their fortune via the railroads, the automobile, and, and oil, what have you. The tycoons, the men who build America. The idea of the assembly line was crystallizing into reality with the birth of mass production. Mr. Ford. In 1902, the General Education Board was a non-governmental organization designed to support higher education and was funded primarily by John D. Rockefeller. You hear his name on PBS all the time, brought to you by the John D. Rockefeller Fund. Throughout his lifetime, he donated approximately about $180 million to this fund. And the board's objectives were to promote farming, to establish public high schools in the South and to develop programs for African-Americans. And we celebrated John D. Rockefeller for this act, unfortunately. Why was uh, he so giving? Why was he such a philanthropic man into giving to schools? What was his motivation for doing this? Rockefeller said, 
And I have to warn you about this quote, but it is true to who he was. He said, I don't want a nation of thinkers. I want a nation of workers. And this sounds like, to me, your church. Here's his full quote. In our dream, we have limitless resources and the people yield themselves with perfect uh, docility to our molding hand. We shall not search for embryo, great artists, painters, musicians, nor lawyers, doctors, preachers, politicians, statesmen, of whom we have an ample supply. It's too many of them. The task we set before ourselves is very simple as well as very beautiful ones to train these people as we find them to perfectly ideal to a perfectly ideal life just where they are. We need workers. In many cases, independent thinking and higher uh, ambitions were completely squashed. There was a famous story about the, the young uh, Malcolm Little, who would later become Malcolm X. He heard his teacher tell the white students in his class that they can be whatever they want to be. He was at the top of his class and was looking for encouragement on pursuing law as a career like I was. And he tells his teacher that he wants to be a lawyer and was told that his dream is unrealistic and that he should work with his hands, maybe become a carpenter. And here is where my father came in, who gave, had, gave birth, him and my mother. My mother did the birthing, but my, my father did the other thing. To seven boys, back to back to back. Education was not the conversation in our house. We were encouraged to put on a blue collar. My father was a carpenter. Now, there's pros and cons to what he taught us. I'll go into that later on. Many people say that the education system in America is broken. And I agree that in some areas it is a terms of treating our teachers and students, uh, students that is fairly. However, in terms of what we learn and how we experience learning, the education system is working exactly how it was supposed to work. If you were trained to memorize and for quick recall, you were a great asset where? In a factory. You don't need to think. You just need to do what you were told and focus on that task. Somehow we picked up on the fact that being smart was an undesirable trait. You are considered a nerd. Proper. Uppity. Those who were thinkers in school were mercilessly harassed emotionally and physically by bullies. They were called geeks and nerds, and if they were harassed, they were socially excluded. So to this day, we as a nation are still experiencing the fallout of our educational system. And after spending our formative years in school, people still don't know the basic facts of the history behind it. Anything we learn that can't be applied to our daily lives is not retained at all. And you can find dozens of man on the street videos where an interviewer asks random people basic questions. They don't know, especially geography. You ask an American about politics and geography and if you ask, you go on the street right now and ask an American who is the Speaker of the House. The average American can't even tell you. They can't tell you who's the who who is in the successor after the president and the vice president dies. Who's next after the Speaker of the House dies? Who's next? No, no. Most people don't know. Most people can't answer them correctly. People don't know how long a decade is. People think that the United States is a continent. They think that Africa is a country. The average American spends on average about three to four hours a day watching television and about 20 minutes a day reading 20 minutes a day. And that's a lot because I don't even see people read anymore. Unless you're reading something on social media that has to do with a monkey doing something stupid. And that monkey might be your preacher. <laughs> 
Now that we have Google, people don't bother to retain anything at all. We may not be able to fix our educational system in our lifetime because it ain't going to be fixed. However, the most important solution is for us to take our education into our own hands. We don't have to rely on our schooling. You don't uh, have a, to spend a ton of money to educate yourself in an area that you may feel you would like to brush up on. The only th ex um, difference between what I just said about the educational system and not needing that system is if you want to be a doctor. You can't do homeschooling to be a doctor, nor a nurse, nor a lawyer. All right. Many things you cannot do. You need the system to teach you that or you will never get, you know, you, you will never get a license for that. We need those systems in place. But there's a lot of things we learned. And right now, much of this you don't remember. Much of the stuff you learned in high school and college. Some of you just graduated from college just last year. And most of the stuff you do not remember. <laughs> Am I in trouble yet? I know I am. You forgot most of it. We are different in how we individually learn. But the school system is not set up for the individual on how he or she should learn. A girl learns differently than a boy. You put the girls and the boys in the school together, the class together, and the system told you that boys learn slower than girls. I'm sorry, I got a problem with that. It's not that they're slower than girls. It's just that they are different than girls. And now the advancement of education and the study, even through the ACES uh, experiment, we're now realizing that boys learn differently than girls and not that they're slower this is why you have to put a basketball in the boy's hand. You got to put something tangible in his hand. You can't let him just sit there and, and, and listen to a lecturer. He's got to get up and move. He's got to do hands-on things. He's different. You give a girl a Barbie doll or something, and she's good with that stuff, but a boy needs something a little more hardcore. You understand? He needs to, he he needs something. He, he And so there's a little boy in all men. This is why there is a, a fight with couples. Husband and wife fight, 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 because she don't understand the little boy. She don't understand that that is a man and he operates and thinks differently and his emotional, his, his, his emotional uh, aspect or reality is different than yours. He don't express his emotion that much outwardly through audible sounds or what have you like yours. He is just as emotional as you, but his is is encamped and is it expressed differently follow him to go buy a new car and you will see a man's emotion <laughs> follow a man to buy him a new car and you will then see his emotion so when you realize that men think differently, then you will understand the structure behind the book that men are from Mars and women are from Venus. Go back and read it because it, it is true. We just are a different breed. Mm -hmm. So because you are a slower learner than someone else, you are considered a failure. So they will put you or your child in a remedial uh, a, a slower class because they think that he's slow. But all you really need is more time to catch up. So when I was teaching school, I didn't say remove this kid. I said, give me more time with the kid after school so that he could catch up. He's, he's not slow and it's his totality. He's, He's just a slower learner because he's probably a very analytical learner. Hear me when I say this. As an educator <laughs> who don't have a degree in education, I don't have a teacher certificate, but I understood by teaching these kids how, how it is. He or she may be analytical 
not slow. It takes me a long time to read something. And people say, you still reading that? Yes, because I stop at every word that might be foreign to me, that might be newer to me, or that I think that will, it, what, that I'll start reading a book and then I stop at this word or phrase and then go into uh, um, dreaming or visions. I'll have a vision and then I'll, I'll daydream away from the book. So it takes me a, a long time to read a book because I see something that, that, that catches my attention and my vision and then I'm sh- adrift. That's why I had a hard time in school. I, it was, I was horrible in school because I couldn't focus on what the lecturer was doing because the lecture was just too boring for me. But then if I'm, if I'm doing something, if I'm reading something, if we, if we got an assignment and it takes me a while to, to do a test because it's like I'm overly analyzing the test or the material or when they told us, okay, read this paragraph and tell me what it, I want you to comprehend what this t- paragraph is. I, I, I was the, the last one to pass in the test on comprehension because it took me too long because of my creative juices. That's it, Dr. Cage. My creative juices, me being the artist that I am, it takes me a while. When I'm sitting there talking to someone and we're disagreeing, I'm listening. I'm listening. You, why do you want me to talk? I'm listening to you. I'm analyzing every word and every phrase that you're saying. And I'm also analyzing the way you are saying it to me. So I'm listening to your emotion, your intent, and how you process the information that you're giving me. And I'm sitting there processing all of that at one time. And then I will respond. Now that takes patience, yes. But that's the way I communicate with people. It's looked to as being weak, but my meekness is looked to as weakness, but that's actually strength for me because I'm hearing every word and phrase that you're saying. And then I can determine whether you are overly emotional. You're just throwing stuff at me because you, you're emotional and you just want me to feel your pain. Like that woman at the courthouse, she began to tell the court how horrible of a man I was. And she was just throwing all this stuff, all this stuff. It was emotion, emotion, emotion. I'm sitting there crying. How could she say these things to me? And the Lord had to work with me sitting in that courtroom. She wants to destroy you. So then finally, when there was a hush in the room, she finally said, there's nothing that moves this man. And that's when I got it. Mm-hmm. Come on, Dr. K. I'm glad she's here. Stay with me, Dr. K, because if, if anybody I need in the room, I need you. No child left behind was the nail in the coffin. Do you all understand what I'm saying? So because you are slower learner, you are considered a failure. But all you needed was more time to catch up. So in a class lecturer or if you're sitting in church listening to your pastor, you are either bored because you are intellectually advanced. So you're sitting there and you're bored or you are confused because you are behind. So a good teacher needs to know how to talk to a general audience. There's still going to be some people who might be bored with your content because depending on what it is and how your presentation is, they might be bored because they are too advanced for the class, for the sermon. There are popular, very popular pastors, I'm not going to say their names, who are over mega churches. Yet they do nothing for me, absolutely nothing. And I'll be sitting there like, God, how is it possible that this man is just an orator saying elementary stuff? I mean, yet their, their preaching is elementary at best. And there's 50,000 people in that room soaking this up at the edge of their seats. Why? It has a lot to do with, number one, the presentation, and number two, the literacy level in that room. (laughs) Man, I am so in trouble today. This, This lesson right here, it's getting me in deep doo-doo. 
It has a lot to do with the literacy level in that room. So some pastors and orators have a certain group of people that only they could talk to. And sometimes uh, even, even on my Zoom sessions with the bunkers, there's some people who privately went to me and says, I have to drop out because I don't understand much of what you're saying. I don't understand it, Elder Jones. When I went into the teaching of Revelation and Daniel, I don't, I don't get it. I just don't. So I had to encourage them and say, listen, don't beat yourself up. You're not slow. It just take you a little longer than some of the others. So let me spend quality time with you. So what I did, I had to have private sessions with a couple of the bunkers so that they could get it a little more. I could spend more time with them. All right. Now, your question might been might be too elementary for an advanced class. And, and you don't want to ask the question because you may feel insignificant because your question sounds elementary. Y'all understand what I'm saying. I hope y'all getting this. Thank you for the super chat mission. All right. Miss one that is. So I'll say, give me your phone number. Let's talk about it. Let's go back over it so that you can get it. One, that whole child left behind that Dr. K said, hey, I should have came up with that one. Y'all, y'all understand. Albert Einstein said this. Never confuse education with intelligence. Never confuse education with intelligence. This is the problem. You're putting them together. I know people who got PhDs in doctrines and, and divinity. Yet, I can't still understand how they steal a teaching on Malachi chapter 3 time. <laughs> Telling y'all, my life is trouble, 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 trouble. I can't understand how someone who went to school for six long years still the teaching the elementary things of the scriptures, which is wrong and out of sequence, and don't know nothing about dispensation. I can't understand it. So Albert Einstein was correct. Never confuse education with intelligence. That's why they coined the phrase educated fool. We learned the periodic table in school. We learned the timetable. We learned William Shakespeare's fables. We learned algebra. We learned trigonometry. And none of it I remember to this day. <laughs> The list goes on and on and on. Why were they spending that much time on that stuff? They said they want you to be an analytical thinker. Okay, I get it. But year after year, why? Are you highly educated or are you highly educatable? Hear that again. Are you highly educated or are you highly educatable? Many people who constantly insist on education are sometimes the ones who are easily influenced the most. The one who spend all the most of their adult life trying to go into higher education, getting that bigger degree, a greater degree, more doctorates, more bachelors, more this and that. Many of them are easily influenced because they get bit by the system of education. I know, I know this is hurting some of you. I know. I'm returning back to school. You're never too old, but there's certain things that I know I need to go back. But some of you are going because you just need to say, look what I did. So there's a chart here I want to see show you about the three ways to influence. Now, this chart is supposed to be positive, yet it is negative as well, depending on who's looking at the chart. Master the three ways to influence people. All right, right here, here's the chart, okay? The first one is logical appeal here on the left. The logical appeal. Tap into people's rational and intellectual position. This middle one right here is the emotional appeal. Connect your message, goal, 
or project to individual goals and values. And the third one is cooperative appeal. This really works well. Involve co collaboration. Okay. So here's the breakdown of all three of those right here. Let's look at it. Logical appeal tap into people's rational and intellectual positions. You present an argument for the best choice of action based on organizational benefits, personal benefits, or both appealing to people's what? Their minds. It is logical. This is where I tick. This is where I jump in. I need you to talk to me, but I need to see the logics behind what you're saying. Oh, I'm not interested. Come on, Sheila. She said, I wish someone had told me this 30 years ago. This next one is emotional appeal, the heart. Again, there's nothing wrong with this second one appeal. Emotional appeal connects your message, your goal or project or individual goals and values, an ideal idea that promotes a person's, a person's feeling of well-being. Service or sense of belonging tugs at the heartstrings and has a good chance of gaining support. This right here, the church use to an unhealthy level, the emotional appeal right here to an unhealthy level. The preacher gets up there because it's all about, it's all about the outward appearance. He's dressed to the nine like, like I am. He uses uh, or he is what's called a charismatic man. Can y'all tell me what charismatic means? What is the root word in charismatic? Hmm? Can you tell me? Because those are the ones that get you get dig deep into your pocketbooks. And then to his left or his right or behind him is an organ or a piano or some kind of string. That's it, Deatrice. It's charisma. And the music plays and sets the ambiance or the atmosphere. He's charismatic. He has, he's full of charisma. He looks good or she looks good. And, and then he or she speaks and the presentation is there and you are skirmishing or whatever the word is in your seat. You're being pulled in like the Pied Piper grabbed those children. Sets the mood. There's nothing wrong with that. Because when you go to the movie theater, the producer or director sets the mood. This is why a, when they're creating a movie, they have a person who's called the music supervisor. And the director of the producer sits with the music supervisor to find out what music fits just right with this scene. Ask me how I know. <laughs> I was quite involved in music supervision in media. Set the mood. This happens in the church, though, in an unhealthy way because behind that uh, comes manipulation and witchcraft especially if they can see you are a damsel in distress and here you come. All right, play consecrationally, please. Now, and he gets quiet and uses a whisper. Here's what the Lord is saying to you. Here comes a seed offer. <laughs> okay. Again, there's nothing wrong with setting the atmosphere unless it's being manipulative. This next one is cooperative appeal. Cooperative appeals involve c collaborating. What will you do together? Consulting. What ideas do other people have? An alliance. It goes on and on. All right. These are the three ways to influence someone. <laughs> you are going to need a bodyguard. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. I'm, I know I do. All right. So let me show y'all something here. This was sent to me by a dear friend. The 10 things Christians like to do that aren't biblical. Okay. I'm going to show you on my phone because on the phone it shows you all of it. All right. Uh, how do I do this? Right here. The 10 things Christians like to do that aren't biblical. She just sent that to me right before the show. 
I said, look at here. She said, this is what you be talking about. Here's the list. Let's go down. Worry. Got it. That makes sense. You shouldn't be worrying. Keep going, though. Pray for God's presence. What? God, please be our... Be with our missionaries as they share the gospel of uh, Mexico. Please be with Mary on and on. Pray for God to be with us flies in the face of scripture. Told the disciples, I am with you always to the end of the age. <laughs> Where shall I go from your spirit? I see what they did here. And that's a tough one. I don't always agree with these articles. That is a tough one. Number two, number three, tithe. <laughs> I don't need to go into this one right now, but you know I'm going to revisit it, right? You already know. It's like this article was watching my show a couple of days ago. We'll talk about that in a minute. Number four, include Easter bunny in colored eggs. That's obvious. <laughs> yeah, that's obvious. What's next? Number five. Pray the Lord's Prayer. I get that. Unfortunately, praying, praying it as a personal or corporate prayer is not exactly what Jesus intended. For. They are correct here. Praying the Lord's Prayer is a ritual. It's just a ritual. You're just going word for word, but it's supposed to be looked to as a template. So I get that. I haven't even read this yet. She sent this to me, and I haven't even read all of it yet. Teach us to pray, okay? Um, what's next? Read horoscopes to determine future events. I don't need to go into that. Y'all know that. Blame karma. <laughs> and y'all don't even know what karma is. Karma is not what you think it is. <laughs> it's, it, go back and study what karma is, and you'll be like, oh, yeah, that's not what it really is. All right? Believing in luck and superstition, self-explanatory. What else? We got two more. Drink to get drunk. <laughs> okay. There's nothing wrong with drinking. There's nothing in the scripture that says we can't drink. Uh, the Bible uses the word excess, though. All right. So be careful of that. You do not have to drink, by the way. So don't use, don't use what I said as an excuse. And number 10, retire. What do you mean by this? The Bible is mostly silent on the topic of retirement with the exception of uh, instruction to the Levitical priest. Nowhere does it mention the concept of ceasing work in a the theological matters article uh, retirement. Uh, the idea of retirement is a relatively modern phenomenon. My own great grandpa knew nothing of the concept of retirement. Their generation worked as long as they were physically able and for most of them right up until the time of their death. So security came on and saying, I see what they're doing. This is a tough one right here. John the Apostle was over 90 when he preached. preacher. Okay, now that depends on what you mean by retirement. Are they saying retiring from your job? You, you should retire from your job. All right, so I, I haven't read all of that, but I'm sure they're not just relegating that just to retiring on your job because you should retire. You put a lot of... You, you, uh, labor is worthy of his hire. You putting into social security, you should be able to retire and receive that social security. So I don't know if that's where they're going, but physically you should not retire from doing some kind of work because some people retire on their job, sit at home, get bored and they die. <laughs> right. I know. <laughs> I can't read what somebody just said and they die. Speaking of superstition, I argue with the grandmother every in what, uh, New York New Year's about washing clothes in the New Year's. My hope in Jesus, <laughs> Mary. What? What? Okay. So let, let's get back into this. On Facebook, let me show you how y'all are manipulated. Some of you already know this. On Facebook, the product is not what the advertisers are selling. Who is the product on Facebook and YouTube and Instagram? Can you tell me? 
right, April, how can someone retire from Jesus? <laughs> huh? Who is the product on these social medias? Hmm? Hmm? There you go, TJ. You are. And you didn't know you were. And here's the thing. Facebook did not intend that until they realized, uh uh-oh, those who use social media is the product. How do I know? Because I am a sponsor on Facebook. I am an advertiser on Facebook. When I go to Facebook, I buy an ad so that you can see the ad and you buy my product or go and visit my, my show or my teaching. So when I go to Facebook, I'm looking for customers. But when you really sit and look at the logics of it, the logistics of it, the people is the product because of the data. Remember snail mail? You say, how do I get all this? What are, who are these people sending me this stuff to buy this, buy this, buy that? Because somebody sold your what? <laughs> you are the product. I, as, as a sponsor, I'm paying for a product. And what's that product? You who are watching my stuff. And you've got to know that when you go to church in many churches, you are the product. Y'all better hear, hear me. You are the product. Even in the hip-hop world, rap, when I was coming up, at one time, they pushed financial independence in their lyrics, ownership, and self-worth. Not anymore. It's all about sex and vulgarity and violence and overtaking this and that nastiness. So every system and every sector of our lives has turned into this robots, robots, Will Robinson, danger, danger, Will Robinson. Uh, Y'all too young for that. As a matter of fact, here's a quote from big daddy Kane. The song was a job ain't nothing but work. He said, control what I hold and, of course, be the boss of myself. No one else will bring my wealth. Big Daddy Kane. Those were the lyrics I was hearing when I was coming up. Mm-hmm. Yes, you see, you're saying something here. Rogers, I saw something there. They have sold all your information. Every time you enter into your browser, they know every place you've been and what advertisement to put in. Yep. Yes. And what is it called? It's called repurposing. This is how you are. You, you're wondering, okay, you was on Google. You was on Amazon.com looking for uh, some glue to help you with your weave a <laughs> Your weave keep coming out because the, the glue that you're using, unfortunately, when it gets too hot outside, it just, just it doesn't work. So you're on Amazon finding a better glue, Gorilla Glue for your weave. <laughs> okay? And then you go on Facebook, and while you're looking at your friend's post, that glue pops up on Facebook, and you're like, I was just looking at that. Wow. Then you go on YouTube and watch some video and there's the glue again. Why? <laughs> it's all about the, uh, the algorithm and the repurpose. As an advertiser, I know how to do that. <laughs> That's a stronger glue. My hair will never fall out again. <laughs> no, it won't because it's forever attached to your skull through that gorilla glue. <laughs> forever. Enjoy each other's company because you're going to die with that. <laughs> All right. So you are a bad. You are bad with with uh, your finances. Some of you are bad with finances. Why? Because you are a part of the system. 
They didn't teach you about finance in school. They gave you this much history or lesson on finance. You know how I knew the, the further I got with finance in school, and I'm talking in grammar school and high school, was this. One day, they pulled out a checkbook. It was a projector. I remember the, the old projectors, all right? And they pulled out a checkbook. Uh, they made copies of the checkbook, and they gave us, and, they, you know, back then there was no uh, IBM, you know, photo thing. So they, they went and got the alcohol, and they poured the alcohol on that machine, and, you know, and then they put the paper in there, and they... <laughs> <laughs> Yo, you got to be at least 50 years old to know the struggle was real when we were coming up. <laughs> Uh-oh, we out of alcohol. <laughs> go go to the office and get some, tell the principal to give us some alcohol. <laughs> the struggle was real. And then they gave us to us and they said, now here's how you, how you write a check. Pay to the order of. Date it. Write the amount and write out the amount. Sign your name and in the memo section, say where it's coming from. On the back, you sign your name if a check came to you. That was one day out of the many years I was in grammar school and high school, that was it. They was teaching you how to be a consumer. <laughs> That's it. And the only way I learned about business and, and finance is because I, ha I, went to, uh, I went to school and I started to study uh, finance and accounting, business administration, and all that stuff. So I had to go to college for that. Or no, I had to go to a business school for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jackie said we learned in home economics how to pay for our groceries. Consumers. We are a nation of consumers. So when you got to church, you all, tithing made no logical sense to your brain, but it made spiritual sense. Here's why I get into even more trouble. I keep getting into trouble. I just don't understand that. I just don't understand why I keep getting into trouble. There's got to be a, a, a trouble gene in my spirit. <laughs> Tithing made no logical sense in your brain. It just didn't add up. And you knew it didn't add up. And something just didn't sit right. But spiritually, it made sense based off of the presentation and based off of how you were coming up. You were part of the system like school. My father said you all have to be workers. But what my father was doing, though, he was teaching us to work so that we can own. So I get what he was doing, but he only knew what he was taught by his father. That generation was taught by Rockefeller to be workers. Mm. To be workers. But then, but my father is sitting on a nest egg right now. He'll never be broke for the rest of his life. Till he die, he will never be broke because, he's, because that generation, uh, African Americans in general, became wealthy through real estate. They understood the power of owning real estate. At least that generation did. The, the silent generation, which is called the greatest generation, and then the uh, baby boomer generation, they understood the, the, the value of real estate. When I went down to Atlanta, Georgia to visit, my son took me on Ashbourne, As, Asbury, Ashbourne, As, is it, what is the street where Martin Luther King and his father, the father's house is? Is it Asbury? See, now, now that revival got me all jacked up. Is it Ashburn? And it was a, a, a the, the ranger was taking me and my family up and down the streets and, and showing us the houses. This was a, a young white woman. Showing us the houses. You boys, those of you who live in Atlanta, what is that street? Is it Asbury? I can't remember. And she said, 
these people here were not poor. Ashburn, Luann Walls, thank you. Auburn, not Ashburn. Auburn Avenue, there it is. Auburn Avenue, that's what I thought. Yeah, I know Marlene said jacked up by his feet. Okay, was that, did I say that? All right. She said these people were not, they were not poor people. See that these people, were, they were pretty much well. They did, they did good for themselves and they built these homes. I said, what? Yeah, they built these homes. Mm-hmm. The fact that they don't even teach cursive writing anymore. I know, Rogers. Yeah. She said, these people... Those people you saw on these civil rights movies, you always see. One day I started to fight. Keep your eyes on the prize. Hold on. Every time you turn on PBS, you see these people who look very poor. Please. Many of them was mud deer. And my mud deer owned buildings. (laughs) My family, my grandfathers, my, uh, Uncles and my aunties own property. It was theirs. And I'm talking like fully theirs. Mortgage paid and burned. That's all I saw. If I am poor today, it's not their fault, mine. Because they understood the value of ownership. You understand? So my father was teaching me, us to Go ahead and work, save, but negotiate. Mm -hmm. My father was working as a carpenter for white people, but he was negotiating while he was working. He was code switching. He's a brilliant man, even to this day. And he realized that white people were running away. The white flight. Black people was moving in the neighborhoods, and they were like, there go the neighborhood, and the, the, the value was going down. And he says, I'll take it. And my father began to negotiate with them. He began to work in those buildings and he began to purchase and go down to the bank, get these loans, which was very difficult to do. And he began to buy this property. So I got his vision, what he was trying to do. It wasn't working for me. The end result worked out for him. The end result wasn't working for me. (laughs) It wasn't working for me. Auburn Avenue were people who owned their own home. Matter of fact, they built it from the ground. They understood the concept. And those churches that these black churches, they came together and they put all their monies together. They didn't go down into the bank with no money down. And then now they got a 30 year mortgage and their mortgage is $5,000 a month. Now they raised that money. And if they went down to the bank, they only needed just a little bit. <laughs> and then they hired the workers and they built those, those churches. It became theirs. In a short, there weren't no 30 years. It didn't take them that long. <sighs> What's going on today? <laughs> what is going on today? I don't want to say too much. My Kojic pastor here in Indiana used to complain about how the state leaders would bribe the people for money. I know, Jackie. You know, you I don't get me talking about the Church of God in cash. Quiet as it is kept, it was uh, a boomer shift uh, post-integration. Go to school, get a job, pull yourself up by your bush up. Yep, and the battle was won. No more fight. People settled if their family was, yep, I know. My father had a good plan. The plan worked for him. It didn't work for the generation X, which was my generation. It didn't work for us. I was not going to work for the man. I, d- I understood that school system. Who was this uh, rich dad, poor dad? What's his name again, you all? He talked about the school system. Before I even read the book, I said, that was me. I wasn't trying. It, it, it was my rich dad, poor dad. It was my, my well-off uncle and my struggling father that I learned from. There were the things that my struggling father did I wasn't going to do. I wasn't doing it. The end result of my struggling father, though, is different, which is different in the book, is that he made it. My rich uncle, I wanted to know what he was doing. Thank you, uh, Van Zell. Uh, Robert uh, 
Kiyosaki. I want to know what my rich, what my rich uncle did. How did he run that store like that? And he became wealthy. So I took both my rich dad and my poor, my rich, my poor father and my rich uncle. I put those concepts together and I said, there's no way I'm going to spend the rest of my life working on a job for pennies and struggling and own nothing when I'm done. And I would never allow one entity to become 100% of my resource because I was working for the church and the church was 100% of my resources. And I said, Walter, you're foolish man because if the church closed down, you got nothing. You lose everything. And I went from church to church thinking, okay, if things going to get better, things going to get better, things going to get better. But they never got better because I didn't understand the, uh, the value of ownership and uh, different levels of streams of income. And I don't know no rich person, no wealthy person, no mogul who leans on one thing. Look at Amazon. Amazon went into business by selling books. Here's the funny thing about that. Amazon didn't write books. <laughs> Amazon was selling your book. And then they got into different streams to stay alive, to keep it going, and became the largest, one of the largest companies in the world. Who else did that? Uber. <laughs> Uber didn't make cars. Uber didn't sell cars. Uber used your car to make money. <laughs> I don't think you all get it. And so they, they, you supposed to make money in your sleep. That's what I was taught. While you are asleep, you should be making money. Well, how do you do that? You can't do it on a nine to five. So you've got to be able to create an idea and let people run from around the world. Let them run to that idea while you are asleep. They are paying for your idea. But don't just use, don't just create one idea. Create another idea from that one idea. And you got a second idea. Create another idea from that. And here how you create what's called a niche or niche market. Or you're serving a niche market. Do you understand? And it doesn't take a whole lot of people. It's really 20% of the people are doing 80% of the work. It's the 80-20 rule. You all are trying to get 80 100% of the people to do most of the work. It never worked that way won't work that way and i learned in marketing that if you put a product out there you're only going to get a rate of return on about four maybe five percent of the people will respond in kind and purchase your product only five that's it which means you got to do more to get some people if you if you have an arena you've got a a, a, a concert what have you and the arena seeks 500 people let me test you all you've got a concert coming up you rent a hall, it seats 500 people. How many people do you invite to that concert? Put it in the comment section. Hmm? Hmm? Can you tell me? Hmm? Because the airlines do it for y'all, and you don't realize it. You don't realize it. Mm -hmm. Can y'all tell me? 50, it seats 500 people. How many people do you invite? To come to your concert. Can you tell me? Just a woman who loves God said 2,000. As wild as that sound, she is right. Deborah says 2,500. That's right. No, Carol, you don't invite 600. You're going to lose. <laughs> you better. I'm telling you, the airlines do it to y'all all the time. They always overbook. Notice when you get there, they say, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, customers, if there's somebody who wants to fly later on, we'll give you a voucher or we'll give you this free or we'll give you this or we'll give you that. I wonder why they do that. <laughs> you got to learn the concept of overbooking. <laughs> Number two, you've got to learn the concept of over-delivering too. You, some of you people are just stingy and cheap. 
you got a product and you don't want to you don't want to cut corners here. You don't want to give people deals. That's where you fall. Amazon is wealthy today because they understand the concept of over delivery. Y'all better hear me. I don't care if you hate. Is it Bezos? Who is that? Who is it? Which one is it? I get I get caught up. I get confused. Over deliver. I often wonder why how how is Amazon affording to do this? There are many times when I know for a fact that the guy delivered the package. It say delivered it, but I don't see it. It went next door, and it's like okay, uh, I, my package ain't here. Don't worry, we'll either refund you or we'll give you a new one in the mail. And if that one do come, don't worry, you got two now. <laughs> I'm like, whoa. I don't know no black business that do that. Oh, you found the other one next door? Can you bring our stuff back? Can you please bring our stuff back? <laughs> you got to know how to over deliver and to overbook yourself. That sounds irrational for those of you who are poor in spirit. <laughs> but this is how the wealthy stay wealthy. Man, man, let me tell you. <laughs> It's a lot. It's a lot here. I, I, I don't. I, it's. I said I was gonna quit at a certain time. I better quit now. All right. So going back to the whole logic behind your church and manipulation and illiter and in illiteracy. Some of you are illiterate, and the church know that, and so they will always have a product. You are the product. And they will bring it, they will give you a presentation that make you feel that spiritually God wants this. But when you go home, you're losing everything. You're losing everything. Whose fault is that? A lot of it is our fault. Because again, when I go back to the whole tithing concept, is that the answer is in your house right here in the book and somebody from the pulpit from the school system from the government from the white house from the governor's mansion said i know what's in your hand but don't believe what's in your hand do you all hear me you got to hear what i'm saying here as i close it down because i ain't ate dinner yet the answer is in this book and for generations, they've been putting a wool over you and telling you, no, that's not what it says. Oh, it's not? No, that's not what it says. Oh, thank you. And you put the book down. And those who are more noble than you all are, <laughs> the Bereen said, whoa, I'm going home, Pastor. I'll be back next week. And they opened it up and they went from line upon line, precept upon precept. They went to BibleHub.com. They went to Matthew Henry. They went to Jameson Fawcett and Brown and Dakes. And, man, they went all through there. The, the spirit field life. They went from concordance to concordance and says, I did my homework. They went back Sunday and says, and then somebody went over the pulpit and said, you will be cursed with a curse, blah, blah, blah. And the Marine says, use a lie. <laughs> Loose here. That is not the scripture. Ask me how I know, because I did that. Me, me, me. The church had a meeting with me because I refused to pay tithe. And they tried to manipulate me in the meeting. Elder Jones, I don't understand why we need to get people to pay tithe because they're just not paying. And, I, and I'm saying to myself, they think I'm boo-boo the fool. They're saying, they literally saying, that these people are not paying tax, but they know I ain't paying it. So they bring me in a meeting because they want to find out why I'm not paying tax. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Y'all think I'm that dumb? I know I'm skinty. I know I'm nice. And I'm calm and cool and collected. And y'all say I'm humble and all this. All, but I'm not boo-boo, nor am I his fool. I said, meeting adjourned. They said, what, what, meeting adjourned? Yes, meeting adjourned. What do you mean meeting adjourned? We called the meeting, yes, but I'm adjourning in this meeting. Why, Ella Jones? Because I'm smarter than the average bear. <laughs> 
and smaller than the average bear. I'd rather talk to you all individually because if I tell y'all what I know about tithing at this table, because I had the pastor, the first lady, the chairman of the deacon board, uh, a trustee board member sitting there, they call me in the meeting. How's that? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> this ain't working. I can't do this at this table because if I get through whatever with my presentation, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make all y'all look silly. The meeting is adjourned and I got up and walked out. <laughs> I walked out. Because I did, because I was afraid if I told them the truth and showed them the truth that the pastor would still be teaching a lie because he would be saying, but, but, but he would be deflecting over here and over there. He would be isogetically saying this, that, that he'd be sprinkling manipulation at the table, all this stuff. Because once these people come into the knowledge of the truth, like Creflo Dollar did, then here's the problem. Creflo didn't go and tell y'all he was in error right away. He had been knowing he was in error, but he had to continue like, um, Benny Hinn, he had to continue. And he even told y'all, like I said a few days ago, Benny Hinn told y'all, I knew the truth about prosperity, but I had to keep doing it because I was afraid. Creflo Dollar, finally, I bet you the night before, he rolled in his sleep all night long. He sweated all night long. He walked all night long. He went into the bathroom a few times. He went to the refrigerator. He poured water on. He couldn't sleep all last night. I couldn't sleep at all last night. Do, 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 do. Okay? And then when he finally got to church, he was shaking in his boots because he knew that he had to tell them the truth. But he had to do it in a way that didn't make him look bad. So that's why when you watch the video, he's pointing the fingers at other people who talked about tithing. How dare you all? How dare you all? And his member got in the car and turned on the Facebook app and said, Pastor, y'all remember that young man? Pastor, how are you going to be mad at these people when you were the one for 30, 40 years teaching us? We paid our monies. We gave our tithes. We did this, and now you you making us feel, no, nah, brother, you got to apologize. Y'all remember that? I'm sorry, y'all. Part of the problem is we ourselves, is us. And logically, if you look at it, it never made any sense that you've paid ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars in tithing for these many years, and when you look at the return on your investment, it adds up to literally nothing. And you go and you base it off a of poor. Uh, they manipulate you by giving you these poor, horrible, stupid testimonies about there was a thousand dollar check unexpected that came in the mail. Horrible. If you talk to the world and say, I paid $20,000 in tithing over the past uh, two, three years, and I got an unexpected check in the mail for $1,000, the whole world will laugh you to scorn. They would kick you out of the stock exchange. <laughs> no one would ever invest in your corporation. You are a horrible steward of your money. Horrible. You basically just gave it away and there was a hole in your bag. They, always, they often talk about you're going to have a hole in your bag if you don't pay this. Well, I got a hole in my bag for paying it. I can't tell you how many people came to me and told me, that we paid tithes faithfully, but we lost our car, we lost our job, we lost our home. But we kept paying because we were afraid of the curse. And the, and the thing that kept them was these testimonies of, I tried God and I tested him. And so we began to pay our tithe. And as soon as we paid our tithe, I got a raise on my job. We bought a new home and we got a brand new car and all this stuff. That's all it takes is one testimony like that. 
and thousands will begin to pour into the bucket. And you all know what this is? This is the casino effect. The casino will, will gas up a van and come to your neighborhood and pick you up for free. Drive you to the casino and feed you. The best food in the world is at the casino. Ask me how I know. That food is like $30 a plate. (laughs) Okay. Y'all better hear me. Feed you for free. And then you're going to go in there. They might even give you a a couple tokens. You're going to go in there and go, come on, Carol, free alcohol. (laughs) Hold on, wait. I think I got, I know I got something here. Where is it? What do I got? Right here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then everybody come around you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. You just won. How much did you win, though? <laughs> okay. You just won. How much did you get? Man, I won $50. Really? Wow. How much did you spend? 200 <laughs> Wait a minute. You spent fifty dollars? Yes. I mean you won fifty dollars? Mm-hmm. And you spent two hundred dollars to get it? Yes. Where are you going next week? I'm going back. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. You going back. Somebody said it sounded like you a gambler. <laughs> yes, yes. How much did you win? I just won a hundred dollars. Yes, man, boy, my 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 spree, man. I'm doing all right. Yeah, how much did you spend? Only three hundred dollars. <laughs> <laughs> and then guess what you see you, you you watching a commercial gamblers anonymous if you have a problem go to 1-800 <laughs> save yourself <laughs> and guess what you losing your wife she's walking out on you i don't understand why you can't see the logistics behind a poverty spirit the church acts the same way. Somebody testifies that when they believed God and tested him and tried him, they started paying their tithes and they started getting these things. Here's the problem with these things. Are you ready for this? Hmm? Are you ready? I need y'all to, I need y'all to have a seat and buckle up. Okay. Cause I'm gonna do this and, and go. Cause my dinner is waiting. It's somewhere, but this show is waiting. All right, buckle up, because I'm going to show y'all how the manipulation works, okay? <clears throat> you ready for this? Huh? You ready? Tell me you're ready. Let me know you're ready. <laughs> okay. I wish I had some keys. I could, I could show you better with the keys. Um, <laughs> I can only tell my story, okay? I can't tell nobody else's story, but let me tell my story. So, I, I, I went down there to the car lot and I saw the car that I want and I, I put $800 down and car note was about, at that time, was $350 a month, all right? <laughs> about $350 a month, uh, four, five year at least on the car. And I, uh, I went to church, drove up, there's my car. Everybody like, oh, look at what... what is that a rental car? No, it's mine. Ah, it's mine. Ah, it's mine. It's just, oh, praise the Lord, Brother Joe. Oh, the Lord has blessed you. No more on the bus. No more 
on the train. No more asking for rides. Woo, praise the Lord. And I went in church, got on the microphone, and I said, look what the Lord has done for me. And I shook the, the keys. I shook the keys. And the saints went up. Hallelujah. I praise the Lord. Brother Joe's got a blessing. I said, if you try God and trust him, <laughs> if you trust the Lord, he'll bless you. Hey, hallelujah. Everybody praise the Lord. <laughs> About five months later, I was asleep. <laughs> and I heard my alarm go off. Kiki, 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 kiki. Yeah, I quickly got up and I looked out the window. <laughs> candy, candy, got it. <laughs> candy, got it. I quickly got up <laughs> and I saw somebody going through my <laughs> going through <laughs> and I saw this truck. I'm like, did somebody call AAA? <laughs> somebody got a flat tire. I see a tow truck out there. <laughs> beep, 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 beep. <laughs> Wait a minute, that's my car. <laughs> I ran outside. I said, Whoa, what y'all doing? Uh bro, you ain't paying your bill. Yeah, uh, I'm making arrangements, and man, you ain't made arrangements in three months. Yeah, yeah, but 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 uh, but nothing. Here's our car. You, you come pick up your car when you call the uh, the American Credit somebody. I don't, I don't. Who was it? It was GE Capital. GE Capital, you demons. <laughs> GE Capital, you demons. <laughs> she says it's a sound you never forget. <laughs> beep, beep. It took my blessing away. And that right there was a lesson to me. <laughs> now, that's not even counting how many boots I got on that car. <laughs> Danny said, GE Capital, a beast. Are they still around? That's not even counting how many boots I got on that car. I parked in a, park, a spot, a, a, a handicapped spot. One's supposed to park there, got a hundred dollar ticket, put it in the drawer, or just put it on the table, or just put it anywhere, and dip. In Chicago, if you don't pay it over a certain period of time, another one comes and doubles. So a hundred dollar turned into two hundred dollars. Y'all understand? And then there was there was another uh, parking ticket that I got somewhere else, and that came, and I forgot to pay that. That fifty dollar ticket turned to a hundred dollars, and it started to add up and add up. You dummy! I'm talking about me, y'all. I ain't talking about y'all. I was the dummy in church dancing. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Thank you, Jesus! Thank you, Jesus! Speaking in tongues, just praising the Lord and going home poor. Waiting on God to come through, come through, come through, because I gave a percentage of something. He come through, come through. Principles. It's always principles of tithing, but it ain't principles of discipline at home. That's the problem in the church. So the boot man came and put a boot on my car, and I went outside, saw the boot, and I saw the sticker in the window, and I got embarrassed. If y'all ever had a boot, you don't understand. It's one of the most embarrassing things to walk out there. And your neighbors are like, ha, 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 he, he, he. I called the boot. I called the city. Hey, uh, can you help me? Can you help me? Can you help me? Help your brother out. Can you help me? Oh, yeah, we can help you. But it's going to cost you $1,500 for us to help. What? Why? <laughs> I, I, I see the tickets here. Do you let me pay the tickets? No, sir. You don't understand. You not only got to pay for these tickets. You got to pay for the tow truck. And then you got to pay for the storage because it was sitting there for a couple of days. You got to pay for the boot to be taken off the car. I said, okay, okay. And then we looked in the system and your previous car had tickets. Oh, Lord, Jesus, Lord, Jesus, Lord. So that one blessing when I paid them $800 for a down payment turned into thousands of dollars of headaches. <laughs> and y'all shouting in church. Thank Jesus. Thank Jesus. Thank Jesus. 
See, when somebody come to church and say, I walked in the store with no money down and, and, and there I got this new house and then I got this new car. I'm not dancing for you. I'm not rejoicing with you So because you went into debt. I'm sorry to tell you, I'm not going to rejoice over your debt. Tell me that the Lord wiped your debt clean and I'll jump up and down. Until then, I'm not rejoicing that you went into debt. My friend had a $100,000 student loan debt, over $100,000 student loan debt. And Biden, in whom I don't always like, said, I'm going to erase that debt one day on TV. And she said, I'm going to try you. <laughs> you see, she tried Biden more than she tried the God of Malachi 3. <laughs> and she went down and she filled out an application and sent it in and said, well, if they do, praise God. If they don't, they don't. A few weeks later, she got a notification that says, you owe us nothing. The government wiped $100,000 off her student loan. I said, Lord, have mercy. Wiped it clean. <laughs> she can't, and she don't pay tithes. Here's the thing. She do not pay tithes. <laughs> oh, man, I don't think y'all get any of this. I don't get so if she went to a church and said this happened, yet I don't pay tithes, Pastor, they're gonna come up with something. Well, well, the Lord's gonna find a way to get that money back. <laughs> All right. So what's the moral of the story? What's the moral of the story? The moral of the story is when it comes to manipulation and, and illiteracy and you getting shammed, a lot of that is your fault. I done beat up these pastors and bishops and apostles for years. But let me tell you something. I need you to pull yourself up by your own bootstrap. Jeff Jackson and his wife, I talked to them today, and I thank God. They had woke up one day and says, wow, look what we did. They are an exception to the rule because they woke up. And they said all this stuff we were doing and the struggles and the suffering we were doing, man, we finally listened and we made a shift. The Lord is blessing them today because of it. I too knew that the answer was in the Bible, but I didn't know how to interpret it. Tithing always shook me wrong. I couldn't understand why is it that I, I'm suffering. I'm trying to pay this thing and I keep suffering yet. They're being blessed. And they say that because they're based off of the tithing. When I realized it had nothing to do with tithing whatsoever, it had a lot to do with discipline. It had a lot to do with stop being a consumer and be a producer. It had a lot to do with the JD Rockefeller system of the school system. And it had a lot to do with you just sitting your behind down one day and going over your finances and deciding to put a little bit away, putting a little bit away, putting a little bit away, get you an emergency fund. All right. When you purchase things, you either decide whether you can get an extended warranty or you don't need that extended warranty. You don't need the gap insurance. Right. You put a thousand dollars away. You put a hundred of uh, fifteen hundred dollars away. You don't have to worry about spending more money on gap, more money on extended warranties, all this stuff, because you got the money offside. So now if, if anything break or anything happens, then you go into that fund and pull it. Ask me how I know I don't buy all that extended stuff anymore because the, the stores are making money on the extended more so than they did the item that you purchased. You better hear, Sir Walter. You better hear, Uncle Sir. I'm telling you how it works. They see you coming. Discipline yourself and put some money away. You know how to do it because you don't have to get all that stuff done in your head every week, every, every month, or what have you. You don't have to do that. You really don't have to do that. You don't. You don't need the latest this and the latest that. You really don't need that. You don't need to go to that. Please, you don't need to do that. Because the average wealthy people said they rode their bikes to work every day. They didn't buy cars. They just didn't. Some of them lived in the this same neighborhood for many, many years. And, and they walked wherever they needed to go. They went to, they went to the, the uh, Jewel, Osco, Piggly Wiggly, what have you. They didn't go to the expensive stores and all. They just did with it and they cooked at home. They did all this stuff and they was putting that money away, saving it, saving it. Y'all go to church and you hear, uh, uh, you've had to, uh, putting away 
uh, an inheritance for your children's children. Everybody who I heard say that when I asked them, where is the money? Ah, uh, well, well, that time is come. Man, no, ma'am. You've been preaching that, putting away and store at the inheritance for your children's children. And when you get sick and you're getting ready to die, your children got to do a GoFundMe to bury your behind. Please, I'm sorry. All y'all doing is giving lip service. Meanwhile, the world is thriving. And the church is sitting there, like, thank Jesus, thank Jesus, thank Jesus, thank Jesus, slobbing. And then the music plays, and then they, they do this tithing offering spill on you, and then you give, and then you go home, and there's no heat in your house. I got a problem with all of that, y'all. I got a problem with all of that, all of it, all of it. I have woke my little skinny butt up. I woke if myself up. You put yourself in that situation. We didn't do it. You did it to yourself. And once you come into the knowledge of the truth, then step up and encourage and strengthen your brother and your sister as well. That's why I get in trouble with the shows that I do. And the Lord keeps, uh, he's, he's using me as a portal. Again, I'm not wealthy. I'm not rich. Some, some months I do struggle, try to figure out how I'm going to pay this, pay that. As y'all know, my, our utilities are high. All right, my, my, my baby girl lives with me, and, and she, 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 she's anemic, and so she needs to be warm. And so our utilities can be very high. But yet I say, now, God, I know, I know what you're doing. I know what you're doing. I know what you're doing. So when people ask me, help me, help me, help me, I do this, I do this. And every time I give out, I get back in. Every time I give out, somebody send me something. I'm looking at the cash app going off now. Since I've been on here, several people are hitting the cash app. I go to the P.O. box, and there, there is checks from the bunker saying, listen, put this somewhere. Put this somewhere. Put this somewhere. And every time y'all tell me to put this somewhere, somebody called Brother Jones, we're getting ready to get evicted. Well, I can't pay for everything, but at least let me do something. Do, let, me, let me pay for an Uber ride from the south side to the north side and then buy, get you some groceries and your baby might need some shoes. Let me do this because the bunkers are taking care of that. And every time I do that, another bunker pours into me and says, Walter, this is for you. Don't give this to nobody. This is for you and baby girl. It's a portal. It's a portal. It's a portal. It's principle. Now, let me say this thing to you all. There are some people who ask for money. I cannot give them a dime. I will not ever give them nothing. Why? Because I know the spirit behind the person who's begging. They become professional beggars. We see them in the comment section all the time. As soon as we go live, the same people say, and they give this sob story about my children, and we don't, we don't have no food, and we're about to get evicted. We know who these people are. We have documented them. There are people even in the family who constantly go to you, cut them off. You are calling them. You are enabling them. Don't give them anything. Cut them off. When I see people on the street begging all the time, what have you, the Lord would tell me, give this person something, but this person don't give them nothing because I know. I know. And until a person say, I'm hungry, I say, let's walk in this store and I'm going to buy you something. I'm not giving you no money, but I'm getting ready to buy you something from the menu. Pick whatever you want. I don't care what it is. I don't care. Just pick it and eat and, and get it. And if, if you need uh, two orders for later on tonight, get that. And if they say, okay, and they start ordering, I know this is this person really is hungry. But if they say, no, I don't really want to eat. I just, if you just give me the money, I'll go buy something that I, that I, that I, I want to eat. And I tell this person, have a good day. <laughs> have a good day. I'm standing in front of Popeye's, and this man is begging for food. And I said, well, I'm going to Popeye's. And the man says, I don't like Popeye's. I says, then you ain't hungry. <laughs> you ain't hungry. <laughs> Because if you are denying Popeyes, that is not of the Lord because Popeyes have been put here by the Holy Spirit. I got to go, y'all. I got I to get out of here. I, it's time to go. It's been an hour and a half, and I, my dinner is cold now. I love y'all, and I appreciate you. Listen, uh, be practical. and uh, Stop being manipulated so easy. Stop being so easily manipulated. <laughs> Read the Bible for yourself so that you won't... <laughs> be going down there sitting at Judge Judy's or whoever the judge is on bankruptcy. <laughs> okay. Come on, do better than that. Be producers. I'll have my brother Larry on uh, again so that we can continue on how to get you to, you know, save and invest and, and, and make sure you have a, an emergency fund and what have you because uh, the economy is about to about to hit you all in the in the in the head and bust you to your to the white meat show and some of y'all are not gonna be ready for it. 
All right, so stop overspending. All right, take care of yourselves and one another. God, I thank you for the presence and the people who are here. I love them. I know they love me. They put up with me, and I thank God for the putting up. <laughs> All right, I might have upset some people, and I thank God that I've set them to a place where they can do better. They can they can tap in to what you've given them. Much of that is common sense. <laughs> thank you, O oh God, because unfortunately, that kind of sense is not that common. <laughs> All right, so I'm asking that you help the people dig a little deeper into the scriptures so that they can see it. their blinders on, and it seems like there's some kind of strong delusion that is, that's that's there uh, by the manipulative ways of the church. So help us and clean up this church so that they will stop giving these people a perverted justice. Justice is needed, and we need it. Oh God, in our churches, help me to continue to do what I do, and when I'm removed, allow these people to continue on with the gospel. I love you, God. I thank you for it. We're giving in the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Take care, you all. Thank you, Bunkers. I went a little over. I said I was going to do an hour in my brain, but that didn't work out. All right. Love you, Danny. Uh, uh, Shirley and, and Carol and, and Roz and Jerome Herrick. Bless it to you. Angelia, Brother McCoy and Monkey Moose. Man, Maria, Drea, and Candy. It, 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 it's, a, it's, a, it's a whole bunch of it's a whole bunch of y'all. I thank y'all. I thank I thank y'all more than I than, than you ever know. I thank you. I thank you. Thank you. Okay, Marcia, blessing to you, Gladys, Tamika, Devin, Mary, gosh, Jackie Miller. I love you and I appreciate you for all that you do and, and the way you deep dive into the Word of God. Jackie Miller, you hear me? You keep diving deep in that Word. And all the memories of the past and a lot of the things of destruction that, that tried to go off against you, the weapons that was formed against you that you think that might have prospered, it didn't. But the word of God is restoring. Amen. Shirley, Lisa, Candy, who who else is this? Denise, uh, Yolanda, blessing to you, Simone. Right? We, we, we wish you a happy birthday, but you wasn't here. The whole world celebrated your birthday and you were not even here. Shame, shame. Faith Mason, blessings to you. Linda, Daniel, uh, Evangelist Thomas, blessings to you. Thank you all for everything you've done. Linda Poole and Monica Lacey. I love y'all. Take care. Love your brother and your sister and your chairman and your mother and father and everybody else. And we'll talk to y'all real soon. Okay? All right. Ja uh, Jackson, uh, Jeff Jackson's wife. Birthday is on the 8th. <laughs> you, you didn't think I heard, but I heard it. I heard it. We'll talk about that when we get to it. Bye, y'all. It's 10 p.m. Do you know where your children are? The Four Women That Men Desire by Sir Walter Jones is a women's guide to men. The authors endeavor to expose men fundamentally with his perspective on the types of women that men truly desire. He has meticulously penned a brilliant and controversial read, bold in its assertion that all women fall into one of four categories. Girl A, the side chick. Girl B, the mistress, girl C, his soulmate, or girl D, his fatal attraction. And when a woman walks into a room, her category is showing. The Four Women That Men Desire is funny, informative, and enlightening. It is a quick read and a must-have for your library. Head over to Amazon.com for your copy.
Sir Walter Jones Show. <laughs> Goodbye.